in the absence of a scripture reading this morning, I want to read the last verse of the song we just sang, because as it seems to happen almost every time I speak, and, and Brother Danny and others who speak can probably say this as well, even if it's not coordinated, it's just, it's just always there. Uh, this will be very beneficial to us in, in our lesson for today. Faith is a victory, verse 3. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know, his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of Lot, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the host of night in Jesus' conquering name. Thank you for that, Brother Earl. Before we do start this morning, I just want us to take a, just a brief moment to consider the blessings of this morning. As each one of us have, have woken up in our homes and our beds in comfort, we have in all likelihood had a, had a choice of food for breakfast. We have had a choice of, of fine clothing to put on. We may have even had a choice of vehicles to, to get ourselves here. And we are now assembled with the saints in order to worship God. And I'll submit to you that it is not of our own doing, and it's not that God has taken his eyes off of us, and that we have earned something that has meant that we can be here this morning. But rather what it is, is it's his constant attention to us and his desire that we would be here and his desire for closeness to us. Praise God for that. I missed it this time. I got it, I got it right the first time. I missed it this time. The lesson this morning comes from Romans, the 8th chapter, in a particular verse there, Romans 8 and verse 18. Before we get to verse 18, let's take a step back and let's look through Romans chapter 8 and let's see what Paul has been discussing in his letter to the church at Rome before we ultimately lead up to verse 18. If we look at the subject of what Paul has been discussing so far, he has been making a comparison or a distinction between two types of people. And I would submit to you, in the context of what Paul is discussing here, there are only two types of people that he could be discussing. There are only two classes. Starting in verse 5, those who live according to the sinful nature, that's the first class, have their mind set on what nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit, that being the second class, have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, verse 6. Not this mind of sinful man leads to death. The mind of sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life. He continues on making this comparison throughout the first half of this chapter. We'll look down in verse 14, and he'll go so far as to say, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are, look at this, they are sons of God. Later on in verse 16, he carries it on further to say, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, verse 17, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God. And again, go so far as to say we are co-heirs with Christ, if if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. That leads us to verse 18. Paul just recounting the fact that we share in present sufferings with Christ in order to be co-heirs with him will indeed lead to us sharing in future glories that are established and given by God the Father. So he says in verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings, those things that he just discussed, whatever it is on this earth that we are facing. I'm considering those. I'm considering my life right now as a Christian and what it takes to follow Christ, what it takes to be faithful, what it takes to overcome, as we just sang about. I'm considering that and what my life looks like now. And when I further consider what my life is going to be like after we pass away or after the Lord returns and we enter into heaven, what does he say in verse 18? It is not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed into us, in us. And I just want to say this morning that he is, he is absolutely, he's absolutely right. And, and no way to, to contradict him, but rather as an opportunity to emphasize the point, what I want to do this morning is I want to make that comparison with you. I want us to study together 
And I want us to consider our, our future, su our present sufferings and what it is we're going through on this earth now. And what it is that it's earning for us, earning not the right word, what it is it's building up for us so that when we reach heaven, these future glories will be revealed in us. So let's do this together this morning. It seems only fitting to start by defining what our present sufferings and what our future glory is. Without that, how can we really have an understanding of what it is that, that we're speaking about? And not only that, we need to also establish how we will go from a state of being in our present sufferings to going in a state of being in future glory. We praise God that he has revealed these things to us, and we, look, we can look in his word for the answers or the questions that we just posed there. So to begin, what, what, are, what are our present sufferings? If I were to ask that question to the world, to those outside of the congregation here, those outside of the body of Christ, the answers would probably be vastly different than I would hope the answers that you would give me if I asked you the question. Uh, we might get things in return like, well, my present sufferings are that my commute to work is an hour plus, my boss is X, Y, Z, my sports team is not as successful as my friend's sports team. You know, those are things that, you know, kind of irritate me from time to time as well, I'll say. Um, or, or I'm jealous of some position that someone has, uh, whether it be social, whether it be an authority at work, whatever it may be. We're, they're focused on the things of this life, of this earth, that are not spiritual. And it's causing them and their minds to suffer. But I would say, brothers and sisters, that's, that's not the suffering that's being, that's being talked about in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. We know this from reading other passages, such as 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 13. There he says, but rejoice, look at this, in your, that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. Here's our first comparison. Rejoice in the sufferings of Christ. That's what we're suffering in, so that you may be, look at this, overjoyed, overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So our first comparison, if we look at these as a scale, it already begins to tip, does it not? We already begin to see the future glory outweighing what we have here where we're suffering now. And we'll, we'll continue, continue the question on further and we'll say, well, Elliot, what are these present sufferings? That, you know, we, we suffer in Christ, but, but what, does that, what does that mean exactly? You'll remember our brother Danny's lesson from a few weeks ago when we were in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. In verse 33, the statement's given, Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insults and persecution. Sometimes each one of us here, and if we've lived long enough, and if we've tried to live correctly long enough, and if we've spread the word long enough, we have come up on those who have insulted and have persecuted our faith. Have we not? Why do you believe such a thing as that? Why do you believe in God? Why do you waste your time following these set of rules and principles to try and live your life in a certain way when it's all for nothing? Because I don't believe any of those things that are listed in the Bible. Guess what? We, we, we've all come across it. right? We, we've all felt that. Not only that, we can at least say this. If for some reason at this point we have not felt, other times, continuing in verse 33, you stood beside with those who were so treated. We, we have suffered because our brothers and sisters around us have been persecuted for the cause of Christ. We suffer with them. But let's continue on our comparison, which he gives for us in verse 34. You sympathize with those in prison, not sympathizing with, with murderers and thieves and things like that, but sympathizing again for those who have participated in the sufferings of Christ and are now in prison because of it. You sympathize with them, and watch this, joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Your present suffering, you joyfully accepted it. Why is this? Because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. We look at the scale again. Right? We, can, we can rejoice in those present sufferings that we're in because what do we know? What's laid up for us is laid out there better and more lasting than what we have now. But we would be amiss if we considered these present sufferings and only said that merely participating in these sufferings 
was enough. We remember our lesson from approximately a month ago when I stood before you in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 7. He who overcomes will inherit all of this. If we back up a verse from the passage we were in in Hebrews chapter 10, we look at verse 32. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you, watch this, stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Brothers and sisters, a contest implies, does it not, that there are winners and that there are losers. There are those that pass and there are those that, that would fail. And as we look again at Revelation chapter 21, we can look back at chapter 20 as well, where those who did not overcome did not inherit. But the specific instruction and specific words are given in chapter 21. He who overcomes, he is the one who will inherit all of these things. So what, what is it that we will inherit? We, we've, we've talked about our present sufferings. We begin to weigh them out with this future glory. And it's already not seeming uh, like a fair contest. But, but let's look and let's ask ourselves, what is this future glory that we're talking about? Best example I can give you again comes from God's word. Revelation chapter 7, starting in verse 9. Here John, in the spirit, has been taken into heaven. And he sees a vision before him in verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people, and language. Standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Down in verse 13, one of the elders who was before him asked him, These in white robes, who, who are they and where, where did they come from? And I answered, Sir, sir, you know. And he said, These are they, watch this, who have come out of the great tribulation. These are they who have overcome the present sufferings they were in in this world and have come out of them, right? They have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, verse 15, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them the springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. How's the comparison looking at this point? What are our present sufferings looking like right now on that scale when it compares to our future glory? Paul's looking to have given a pretty accurate statement there, right? But we can continue on. Let's think about our future sufferings and our future glory in terms of of the space of time that each one of them occupy. Those sufferings for us are so, so brief. When you're in the midst of them, I will, I will not diminish um, that they seem like they could potentially last for forever, do they not? I can't speak as to all the trials and tribulations that everyone here has been through. I can speak to my own, which may fall somewhere in the, any part of the scale. But in those times, it's tough as humans to take our minds off of them, is it not? It's tough to take our minds off anything other than the suffering and just thinking, how, how could this ever end? How could we get away from what it is that we have uh, gotten ourselves into by, by trying to be good people, by trying to follow Christ? How do, how do we ever find our way out of this? Well, I can submit this to you. One we, we don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. We think about getting ourselves out, um, and, and guess what? It, it's told to us in the book of James in verse 14, you don't, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live to do this, or we will live to do that. And here's what I can tell you. When we think of our life as a mist, it's tough for us to understand eternity, and it's tough to us to understand how brief our life is because eternity is so hard to grasp. But when you consider 
the suffering that you might be enduring or might have endured to this point. When your life ends, or whether the Lord returns first, I can tell you this, that is the exact moment where your suffering ends for all time, if you have overcome. All right? And all of these things, when you when you step over the threshold, right, of those pearly gates, having having been let in, when you step over that for the first time, it will never cross your mind again. When you gaze upon the Lord, when you gaze upon the one who radiates light, who created the heavens and the earth, who created you and desired that you would be with him, those sufferings that you went through here on earth will seem as nothing. So whatever you're going through now, it is but for a brief, brief moment. Even still, we, we, we don't diminish we don't diminish those difficulties of our present sufferings. So we look at ourselves and we say, well, well how, do we, how do we deal with them in the present time? Again, praise be to God who has given us the answers to this. If you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 5. He gives us the answer there in Romans chapter 5 and verse 2. Verse 3, rather. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Rejoicing in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Even still, the full, the full manifestation as it's given here of our rejoicing leading to this hope. Let's not kid ourselves that even at that point that our hope is free from persecution, free from, pers from suffering and free from testing. You look back one chapter in Romans chapter 4 and verse 18, we see Abraham, right? And what does it say against him? For him, against all hope, right? He had hope, full manifestation of what was listed out there, of his rejoicing and his sufferings. It was there, but there was still against that. He still had to suffer through uh, waiting for the Lord in his old age and every single day he and his wife growing older to the point of him being 99 years old when they conceived their child, right, suffer through that every day. But what does it say about him? Against all hope, verse 18 of Romans 4, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Watch this. Just as it had been said to him. And here's what I can tell you. You persevere, you develop character, you develop hope, you rejoice in those sufferings, and you overcome just as it has been mentioned in this book, the joys that await for you, just as it has been mentioned, is what will be given to you. It's what will you inherit. These words are faithful, and they are true. Again, we look at the comparison. Paul's words seeming more and more, more and more true, rejoicing in the hope that leads to our future glory. With our comparison, we continue on. We've talked about the brevity of, of our sufferings. How about we consider for a moment the eternity of the glory that we will share with our God. The passage that's been picked out is 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Watch this into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, verse 6, what does it say again? You greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. The brevity of, of our sufferings and how difficult it, it is to understand is so far outweighed by us trying to understand how we will spend eternal glory with God. How do we grasp that? How does the scale look at this point? One more point for your consideration. The cause of our suffering versus the giver of our future glories. 
Let's take a moment to consider the, the source of these sufferings that we have and compare that one with the one who is going to be bestowing future glory upon us. So we ask our questions to begin. Where, where do these sufferings that we're going through come from? We think about Satan and the influence that he has on the lives of men and how he would have it that we would never speak the word of the gospel again. We would never speak of Jesus Christ. We would never speak of God and all that he has done for us. He rebukes those in John chapter 8. Here he has been speaking uh, in the 8th chapter in the temple courts. And later he is now speaking to a group of Jews who begin to question what he's saying here as he tells them about them being freed from slavery and they claim to be children of Abraham and not slaves. Um, and, and they begin this dialogue back and forth. And don't think that he has not been persecuted at this point because it tells us in verse 20, he spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings are put, yet no one seized him because his time had not yet come. It was around and about him, right? It was on the thoughts and minds of those around him to seize him and to persecute him. His time had not yet come. But what does he say in verse 44? You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. When we can consider Satan, we think about all of those negative qualities about him. And, and we, can't, we can't overstate that in any way because it's, they're very true. But let's, let's not lose sight of this. For all of Satan's negative qualities, he is a very hard worker. He just tends to be working for the wrong purpose. So don't ever lose sight of the fact that there is one who would have us not be able to preach God's word. There is one who would persecute us and insult us and take our earthly possessions while we are here. But don't lose sight of this fact as well, that there is coming a time when there will be a separation of Satan and those that follow him and those desire that God's word would not be spread and taught. There will be a separation of those, and there will be a separation of those who are righteous. We consider Matthew 25 and verse 46. There, Jesus speaking, gives a scene of the judgment. And as he's doing that, we have the sheep and the goats, the righteous and the unrighteous, those on the left, those on the right, signifying already that there has been a separation. And he's going to say to those, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Cursed will depart. And I'll tell you this, this is a final departure. They are going off and the sin and the shame and the torture that they're going to will in no way have any chance of infiltrating its way to where the righteous are going. But the righteous, we can see, will then go to the giver of the future glories, as if Satan had not done his own work in balancing the scales for us. We then look at God, the giver of our future glories, who we will be in the presence of for eternity. We consider 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. God would have all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of a truth. Come to a knowledge of the truth. How, how is that? How is that the case that God created each one of us? And, and what, do, what do we do? We, we in turn sin, right? Causing the need for his son to come and be crucified on the cross for us. Even still, we, we, we continue to sin, even even where we are now. But what is, what is God's desire? One that would be with us for eternity. Revelation chapter 21, verse 6 and 7. We've referenced it already this morning. But just think of the one. Think of the one who could speak these words to us, to, search, to such sinners. He said to me, Revelation 21 and 6, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. 
To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. What does the comparison look like of one who has done absolutely nothing for us never will, and only desires our destruction. The comparison of he with the one who has done everything for us and will continue to do everything for us. What does a comparison look like? I would say at this point, it's it's past the point of of no return, as we would say. The scales are, are infinitely tipped in that favor. There's one other thing I want you to consider this morning. We talked about those who have overcome, and that's a glorious thought. But on the opposite side of the coin, there are those who will not overcome. The present sufferings versus the sufferings of those who will forfeit their future glory. Some will not overcome. In these passages, we realize this contest. Some not overcoming, teaches us that they are currently in present sufferings, right? You will not overcome teaches us that there are those who are currently in present sufferings, participating in the sufferings of Christ that will not overcome. This is emphasized in Hebrews chapter 10, and verse 39. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. If you shrink back, then that gives the connotation that at one point, You are wholly forward. You can't shrink back from having not been somewhere in the first place, right? We are not those, but we are those who believe and are saved. Let's skip forward two points, thinking about the order of this. You think about being one of those people who participates in the sufferings of Christ and doesn't overcome. That means you know, right? You know what is revealed in God's word. We, we've all thought probably from the time where we began to have some kind of grasp of the concept of, of eternity, the grasp of life or death, the grasp of heaven and hell, we've probably all had considerations of, of various kinds. What we'll be able to see, do, all of these things. We talked about those uh, about a month ago. One of the things that we've probably all thought about is, is our, our memory. right? What will our memory be like when we were in heaven and hell. Will I have the chance to go and speak with a character of the Bible, whoever it may have been, and ask them about what was there? And what, what a noble thing to, th- to think about that and to desire that. But let me submit this thought to you. If you are the one, one of the ones, that said, cursed, depart from me, I never knew you, and you go off into eternal torment, the very last thing you will ever want in the eternity that you will spend there, the last thing you will want is your memory. To be able to think back on what you forfeited, to be able to think back on the chance that you had, that you gave up for all eternity, says there, nothing can be worse. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, it would have been better for them to have not known the ways of the truth than to have known them and to turn their back on the sacred commands given to them. Think about that for a moment. And then when you think about God's wrath and what will be there for eternity, Romans chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up for yourself wrath on the day of judgment. You remember in 2 Kings, when an angel of the Lord came, and in one night, 175,000 Assyrians died. One night. We remember from our lesson a couple months ago, God's power. How in one day, we think about the beauty he created in each of those seven days. One day, he created man and its beauty. One day, the vegetation. One day, the fish that swim in the sea. One day he created that beauty, and we think about what he's been preparing since the foundations of the earth for us. Imagine a lifetime of God's wrath stored up for you and what that will look like if you do not overcome. It's more than we can imagine. So again, we look at our present sufferings, 
and we compare that with the sufferings to come if we don't overcome. And I would submit again, Paul is indeed correct, that the sufferings are just more than, more than we can bear and more than we can compare. To wrap it up this morning, we think about our place here and how blessed we are that oftentimes those persecutions, those sufferings, don't follow us into here. And after here, we'll world apart, we'll probably go home and have lunch. We will go home and do whatever it is that, that um, on a day such as today, probably whatever it is that, that we take joy in from this point forward. And I don't know if it will be today. I don't know if it will be this week. I don't know when it will be. But at some point, if you are living your life, if you are following Christ, if you are living by the Spirit, those persecutions and those sufferings will come. So we just ask ourselves, what, what can we equip ourselves with? What can we leave with so that we know we're prepared to do our best to overcome when the time comes? Brother Danny has been preaching, has he not, through Hebrews chapter 11, these heroes of faith. And we think about those. Noah, right, who for a hundred years built an ark and every day faced scorn of the people, right, who mocked him for what he was doing. Can we think about Abraham and Sarah, who we've already mentioned, who sat through years and years of their life after the promise and grew older and older, but overcame. And I don't know if you picked on the, up on this yet, and I don't want to steal from Brother Danny's upcoming lessons, but he's, he's marching to a climax here, if you haven't noticed it yet. And the ultimate example, we look at all those heroes of faith, our ultimate example is in 12, chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews. Jesus Christ, chapter 12 and verse 2 of the book of Hebrews. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, what was the joy set before him? To sit at the right hand of God and to share, the one who, who was on the cross, to then share his glory with us. Set before him, he counted it as joy. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, verse 4, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart. When he rebukes you, for the Lord disciplines those he loves and punishes everyone he accepts as a son. That's the message for you this morning. If you desire the future glory, there are steps, as we've seen here, to find our way on that path. And if you're already on that path, there might have been things that come up in your life that have caused you to shrink back and to not overcome. Well, in the language of Galatians 6.1, you can be restored back to a right and proper relationship with God. And if you are one there who needs his initial deliverance over and the initial acceptance of the message that's being preached here, we can help you in that as well. Whatever your need may be, now is the time. I'd ask you to please come forward as we stand and as we sing.